Okay, let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we commit this time to you, and we pray that as we consider, again, the important issue of faith, that we might gain some important insights that we can take with us to our ministries, to our families, to our loved ones, to our neighbors, to people at school and work. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Beware of confusion about faith. There's a reason we call Christianity the Christian faith. It's because our religion is a religion based upon certain beliefs, based upon certain doctrines that are passed down to us. And so the Christian faith includes all that God has commanded us to do and the ways He's commanded us to think. Doesn't Romans 12:2 be transformed by the renewing of your minds? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Well, the way our minds are renewed is by taking in the bread of life on an ongoing basis and having our lives transformed as our minds are renewed. And so we've got to believe the Word of God for our minds to be renewed and therefore for our lives to be transformed. Unfortunately, even though we call it the Christian faith and we talk a lot about faith and we talk about needing to believe in Jesus to have eternal life, most people in Christianity today do not know what faith is. That may sound like a bizarre statement, but I'm convinced this is true. I talk to people all the time who tell me, do you know that the Hebrew word for faith doesn't mean what the English word for faith means? That it has commitment and it has obedience? Did you know that the Greek word for faith doesn't mean what the English word for faith means? And it's got, you know, to- you've got to have total dedication and yieldedness and you've got to turn from your sins and you've got to submit? And I said, I should just do what Zane does. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, I-, I sure didn't. Why don't you show me? Uh, Truth is, there is tremendous confusion, and it's not just from the people in the pews, it's also the people in the pulpits across this world. As Dr. Tony Evans said yesterday, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. Well, what is it when there's a fog in the pulpit? (laughs) I guess it's total darkness in the pews. I don't know. But it's worse than a fog in the pews when it comes to this issue of faith. We call it the Christian faith. We don't know what faith is. If we don't know what faith is, then we can't even be sure we're believers. Isn't that obvious? If in order to have eternal life we have to believe in Jesus, and we don't know what it means to believe in Jesus, then we are totally messed up. Look at it this way. Here's John 6:47 in the New Translation. He who whatchamacallits in me has everlasting life. Well, since we don't know what whatchamacallit is, we don't know how to evangelize or who has everlasting life. We laugh, but this really is the way most people view John 3:16 or John 6:47 or John 5:24 or Ephesians 2:8 and 9. When they come to faith, faith is whatchamacallit. And they infuse into that definition of faith whatever they think a person needs to do to have eternal life. And they don't think they're adding to the Word of God. They don't think they're putting poison in the pot. And lots of people will come right out and say, we don't know what faith is. And as we're going to see today... Some of the leading Christians, people with doctorates in theology who are teaching in major churches and schools around the country and around the world, are perpetuating this sort of view of faith. He who, whatchamacallit's in me, has everlasting life. Uh, Do you only think you believe? I get this, I see this a lot, and uh, Robert Dabney wrote a book, um, the short title is Discussions, uh, and back uh, about 15 years ago now, Zane Hodges wrote an article in which he led with a long quote from Dabney and cited the whole title, I'm just giving it, but Dabney wrote this in 1890, so what is that, 115 years ago? And Dabney said, who was a uh, 
you know, a person uh, from an evangelical background, there is a spurious as well as a genuine faith. Every man, when he thinks he believes, is conscious of exercise what he thinks is faith. Is that clear enough for you? (laughs) When he thinks he believes, he is conscious of exercising what he thinks is faith. Clearly, Dabney is emphasizing the aspect of we're not sure if we really believe or not. Do you have a spurious consciousness? Dabney goes on. Now, suppose the faith of which the man is conscious turns out to be a spurious faith. Must not his be a spurious consciousness? I've never even heard of a spurious consciousness, but maybe this is part of the uh, postmodern experience. Um, And he, being without the illumination of the Spirit, will be in the dark as to its hollowness. In other words, he's saying a person can think they believe in Jesus for everlasting life and not believe in Jesus for everlasting life. And because they don't have the Spirit, they don't realize they don't really believe. Uh, This is a very sad position. Zane Hodges, when he comments on this, says, this was February 89, so 16 years ago, in Grace and Focus, he said, obviously the kind of theology Dabney represents strips believers of their grounds of assurance and dangles them over an abyss of despair. Uh, That's a nice way to turn a phrase. An abyss of despair. Maybe churches ought to call that their name. The Church of the Abyss of Despair. (laughs) We don't know if we believe, and come to us and you won't know if you believe either. You know? Now, I'm not making fun of people who hold this. What I'm trying to say is this, is that this is exceedingly common today. Many people have the view that God does not want us to know where we're going when we die because doubt and despair motivates us to live a holy life. Right? And I'm not just talking about people from the Arminian tradition who believe you can lose eternal life. I'm talking about people from the Calvinist tradition like Dabney who believe you can prove you never had it in the first place. And by the way, I don't see any big difference there. One group says if you you fail to persevere, you lose it. The other group says if you fail to persevere, you prove you never had it in the first place. The only significant difference I guess you can see is If you die and find yourself in hell and you find out that the can't lose it position is correct, you can say, whew, I'm so glad I didn't lose it. I just never had it in the first place. (laughs) To me, that wouldn't lead to lasting comfort. (laughs) The the comfort would be very short-lived there. Uh, Only the Spirit knows who believes in Jesus. Is that the correct uh, position? Uh, Walter Chantry has written a book which is wildly popular called Today's Gospel, Authentic or Synthetic. And in that book, he has a discussion, and part of it says this, quote, what must I do to be saved? Is an altogether different question from, quote, how do I know I've done it, unquote. And then he goes on, you can answer the first confidently, only the spirit may answer the last with certainty. So he would say, what must they do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But since we don't know what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, only the Spirit knows those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, to me, something that's like putting defibrillators, however you say that, on my heart and going, because it energizes me and it says, look, this is not some crackpot writing this. This is a man who's written a book that's wildly popular on the rich young ruler. It's widely read, and he's much praised. People on the Internet are calling it a a modern Christian classic. And he's representing a view that is a majority view in Christendom today, uh, one way or the other. Uh, Faith in Jesus is giving all of yourself to God. Dr. James White is a leading defender of five-point Calvinism. Now, I must say he's a particular version of five-point Calvinism. Not all five-point Calvinists would agree with some of the more extreme statements that Dr. White makes. I'm debating him next month in Oklahoma City on April 22nd. And 
someone who's in his church and a member of GES sent me a sermon he gave on Reformation Day, which is October 31st, Halloween, but it's also Reformation Day, and that year it was a Sunday. And he was doing a series on the distinctives of five-point Calvinism, sola gratia, by faith alone, sola scriptura, by the scriptures alone, sola fide, by faith alone. And on that Sunday, he gave a sermon on sola fide, by faith alone. The sermon went about 35, 40 minutes, about faith alone. And here's what he said. He was talking as he led up to this, and he was saying that he wanted people... He says, like you find yourself on an airplane and you'll be sitting there reading your Bible and you strike up a conversation with the person next to you. And so he says, I want you to be able to be clear. And then he will say, people will object and say, quote, that sounds too easy. God must demand more of me. Well, now, when he said that, he himself reflected that he just said something that he has a bit of a problem with. So he says, yes, he actually demands all of you. That's what faith is really all about. Now, he's speaking on by faith alone, sola fide. And he's saying, how do we answer the objection that it sounds too easy, it's just faith, surely must God demand more of me? And his answer to the objection starts out with, yes, he actually demands all of you, that's what faith is all about. He then goes on to say that you need to explain the empty hand of faith, that we don't come to God with anything in our hand, but we come and receive the free gift of eternal life. From the standpoint of an unbeliever listening to that, wouldn't that be confusing? God demands all of me, but it's a free gift. I don't give anything, but it costs everything. It's by faith alone, but faith requires a total commitment of the life to Jesus. This is, to say the least, not what the Reformers meant by sola fide. He goes on uh, in his website on February 28th of this year. He was talking about a debate that he's having with me next month. And as he talked about it, he said this, Dr. Wilkin is a leading anti-lordship advocate. I don't think that's what I call myself, but... Uh, I'm all for the Lordship of Christ. I just don't say that yielding to to his Lordship is a condition of eternal life. But anyway, he says, from my perspective, his position is grossly imbalanced because it insists upon only a single element of truth to the exclusion of everything else. He's talking about sola fide here. He goes on, for Wilkin, faith alone, sola fide, becomes faith separated from the work of regeneration, the spirit, the new nature, etc. Notice this, faith without repentance, all repentance passages are consigned to discipleship, belief without discipleship, etc. It is a very imbalanced perspective, one that comes from an overreaction to a work salvation mindset. Well, it gets worse. He goes, you laugh, but watch what he says here. One of the passages that struck me in light of the upcoming debate with Dr. Wilkin was John 8.51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Keeping Christ's word is surely more than a naked faith. Parentheses, faith without regeneration, faith without a new nature. And then he goes on. Reformed theology cuts the ground out from underneath the position presented by Wilkin, for the faith that saves is the work of the Spirit in regeneration itself and hence cannot possibly be separated from the rest of the work of the Spirit. Let's go back. He believes in faith alone, but he doesn't believe in naked faith. I mentioned this to a few of you the other day, and it's like you've got to put earrings on, you've got to put some makeup on, you know, you've got to have some stuff to dress it up. Well, I don't understand how it can be faith alone, and yet naked faith isn't enough. I mean, isn't naked faith faith alone? What's it missing? Well, it's, according to this, it's missing the work of the Spirit. And, of course, he believes that regeneration precedes faith, so that's part of where he's coming from. Uh, But this whole discussion, I find startling, coming from a person who's within the 
five-point Calvinist tradition and is a defender of it. And I will say he comes from a very extreme position within it, but still he's defending this. He says, White says that the believer has eternal life equals the worker has eternal life. Hence, quote, hence there is no contradiction between saying a person who believes has eternal life and saying that a person who keeps Christ's word will never see death. Now the way he's interpreting that is this. The person who per perseveres to the end is going to prove they're genuinely born again and therefore they're not going to see death. And so he says there's really no contradiction. What he fails to see is we'll never see death is parallel to eternal life. Remember John 11:26? He who lives and believes in me, what? Shall never die. Shall never die is the same thing as we'll never see death. This is obviously spiritual death. It's a statement of eternal security. And he's saying you could tell a person to keep Jesus' word, and that's the same as saying believing in him. Now, actually, I do believe that, because I understand keeping the word in this section in John's Gospel means to believe in him, to accept what he has said about him being the guarantor of everlasting life. But that's not what he means. He means keeping his word in terms of obedience, in terms of perseverance to the end. I think this is highly confusing. And I hear things like this, and I get very concerned because this is a person who's got a radio program. He's written something like 40 books. He's debated, I don't know, something like 100 debates. He's a leading debater against Roman Catholics. And yet, as I see it, his theology is essentially Roman Catholic, even though he debates against Roman Catholics. Notice this from their website, Alpha Omega Ministries. On their website, I decide, when I went there, I decided, well, let me just click on their statement of faith. And here's what he says on their statement of faith. Quote, as a result of this faith, and he's talking about what he believes is the gift of saving faith, based upon the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, God justifies or makes righteous the one who believes. Does that concern you a little bit? Isn't that the Catholic position? Not that he declares us righteous, but he makes us righteous? But you see, one of the things Dr. White likes to talk about a lot is synergism versus monergism. Synergism means we work together with someone, in this case with God. Monergism says God does it all. In his view, God does it all, meaning he regenerates us, he gives us faith, he gives us repentance, he gives us work, he gives us perseverance. And so you can say whatever it is is a condition of eternal life, all that's fine, because in his view, not eternal life, but of entering the kingdom, because in his view, God gives you the whole schmear. So we have nothing to do with any of it. So therefore, I guess he can feel comfortable with makes righteous. Maybe this is a mistake on their website, but I find it hard to imagine that they would make this gross of a mistake on their website unless he really believes that being made righteous is the same as being declared righteous. It's, it's a scary position to me. Faith really is intellectual assent. Let me talk about this for a minute, and this is clearly an area where not all free grace people are on the same page. Some of you are probably going to think, I've either lost my mind or I can't find it. Uh, but the point I'd like to make is this, is faith is a conviction that something is true. Let me give you an illustration. George Washington is the first president of the United States. Are you convinced that's true? Of course. I recently read a book by a friend of mine who's a grace, a grace guy, grace pastor, and in the book he used that illustration. He said, but saving faith isn't like that. Saving faith isn't just believing facts. Saving faith isn't just being convinced of certain facts. You've got to trust the person. You've got to trust Jesus, and that's different than believing facts about Jesus. Whoa now. We just entered a big layer of confusion. Because I can know if I believe certain facts about Jesus, but how do I know I trust Jesus? If it's not believing certain facts, what is it? And this is where everybody who holds the view that faith is not intellectual assent, but it's trusting Jesus, gets off into a fog where there's a lot of confusion. Because people know, okay, I believe certain facts, but do I really trust? And I've met people who've gone through decades of doubts about whether they have eternal life because they can't objectify faith. Are, are you with me? They're, they're tracking on the idea that it's more than simply being convinced something is true. 
faith in Jesus is not dependent on our works. One of the points I make here is that our works and feelings play no role whatsoever in whether we believe in Jesus or not and whether we know we believe or not. The question is simply this. Are we convinced that Jesus is telling the truth when he says, He who lives and believes in me shall never die? Now, if that makes us uncomfortable and we say, Well, no, wait a minute. That's too easy. He demands all of us. Now we've just put some poison in the pot. Now we've just added to what Jesus said. I hope when people hear passages like this, they say something like, are you saying that just by believing in Jesus, a person would be eternally secure? And I'd say, close, Jesus is saying anyone who simply believes in him is eternally secure. It's not what I say that matters, it's what Jesus says that matters. And then they go into why not live like the devil, and we can have a whole discussion about that, but I'm delighted when I hear that. But sadly, most people in Christianity today, when they hear that, they start backpedaling. And they start saying things like, well, God does demand all of you. And of course you can't abuse grace. And of course there wouldn't be such a thing as a person who had eternal life and didn't live like it. And of course, eternal life is being, justification is being made righteous. And so if you're not righteous, you're not justified. And so faith is being convinced something is true and saving faith is being convinced that the saving message is true. And I believe this message here is a good one. Now, by the way, I haven't mentioned that. I mentioned John 11:26 26 three times now in the three main messages I've given. I've not yet mentioned why it says, He who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus typically says, He who believes in me has everlasting life. Right? John 6:47. He doesn't say in John 6:47, He who lives and believes in me has everlasting life. Why does he put, he who lives and believes in me shall never die? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's the promise of resurrection. Now he's saying, what about the person who is not dead and hasn't been resurrected in the resurrection of the righteous yet? Well, any living human being who believes in Jesus shall never die. Never die spiritually. That is eternal life. As the life, this is what he gives. I believe what Jesus is implying here is this, a truth we find elsewhere in Scripture. There's no second chance after you die. You see, in my view, many people, if not most people, if not all people, eventually in the lake of fire are going to wake up. And eventually they're going to say, duh, if I just believed in Jesus, I would have had eternal life. And at that point, they believe the saving message. In fact, they're going to say, duh, everybody who just believed in Jesus is in the kingdom and has everlasting life, and we're not. Why won't they be born again at that point? Because you've got to be a live human being to believe in him to have the promise of never dying. This life is the only opportunity we have to come to faith. And if we don't, it's over. Temporary faith is fully faith. Now, I can't go into all the issues, so I just picked a biggie here, which is the issue of temporary faith. What happened was the Reformers were hit with the idea of passages like Luke 8.13. Let's turn there. And they came up with a, something called temporary faith. Luke 8.13. Luke 8.13 is part of the parable of the four soils. And in this passage, there's four different responses to the word of God. And so here we read in verse 12, Those by the wayside, or the path on which the seed is thrown, are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now notice verse 13. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while or for a time, and in time of temptation fall away. Well, what the Reformers did 
for particularly Luther, but I believe Calvin also held this view, and that was if faith stopped, it proved it wasn't the gift of God. It wasn't the real faith we need to have eternal life. So if anyone stopped, that person would not make it into the kingdom. They used this passage to justify that. And they said what this passage is teaching is if you have temporary faith, you don't have regeneration. Because there's a kind of false faith that believes the right facts, but only for a short amount of time. Now, how long is a short amount of time? They don't know. It might be years. It might be decades. Point is, if your faith ever stops prior to death, if you go into apostasy, then you prove you never believed in the first place. But look at verse 12. Satan snatches away the seed. Why? Lest they should believe and be saved. Satan realizes, Satan, by the way, believes the gospel, right? Everyone who simply believes in Jesus is saved. Why isn't Satan saved? Because there's no salvation for fallen angels or for Lucifer. Once he fell, hasta la vista, baby, you know. Uh, there, Jesus didn't die for fallen angels. Jesus didn't die for Lucifer. But yet he believes the saving message, and that's why he's busy snatching away the seed, lest people believe and be saved. Verse 13 has to be understood in one of two ways. They believe for a time. That either means they were born again for a time and lost it, or they were born again once for all and stopped believing. But you can't take a third view and say they never really were born again, because verse 12 says if they believe they're saved, and the same Greek word is used in verse 13, it says they believe for a time. The illustration I often use is this. Sally's driving down the road. She hears on the Christian radio station here in Dallas, it'd be KCBI, a clear gospel presentation. Simply believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. At that moment, she believes in Jesus for everlasting life, and she, she knows for sure she has eternal security. She's thinking, I've got to go tell my husband, I've got to go tell my kids. This is so exciting. A minute later, she dies on the freeway. Where does she go? Every church I've ever spoken at, they're all pointing up. I say 10 seconds after she believed, she dies in a car accident. Where does she go? One second later, everybody's pointing up. I say at the exact moment she believes, she dies in a car accident. Everybody points up. Now I say Sally, unfortunately, survives the car accident with horrible injuries, and she gets addicted to pain medication. And she goes through about five years as a drug addict, and then she dies. She doesn't go to church. She's angry with God, and she dies. Now where does she go? <laughs> Too bad for Sally, she survives the car accident. <laughs> Right? This temporary faith view actually would lead to the idea that the best thing that could happen to you when you believed was to die. Because then you got your ticket punched. But if you live, your chances are good, you're going to prove you don't have the real article. Uh, another thing I wanted, how long must you believe? The answer is, the moment you believe, you have eternal life. The exact moment. There's widespread confusion about the issue of perseverance in the faith. Most people in Christianity believe that only those who persevere to death in faith will make it into the kingdom of God. If you told people that, look, if a person believes in Jesus and later stops believing, they still have eternal life, most people would think you were a crazy person. But if eternal life is eternal and it's received simply by believing in Jesus, then the moment we believe in Jesus, we have eternal life. In fact, I've often joked that what Jesus is teaching in the parable of the four soils and the seeds is apostasy in seed form. In other words, he's saying, look, believing in me, even for a short time, however long that is, is all it takes to have everlasting life to be saved. Those who believe in special faith don't believe the gospel. This is a corollary to what I've been saying. Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Remember the people who say, he who whatchamacallits in me has everlasting life? Well, people who say that faith is not simply being convinced that Jesus guarantees eternal life to the believer but that faith is, and then they put in whatever they want to put, baptism, turning from sins, commitment of life, selling all you have, whatever it is, okay? Whatever they put in there, those people do not believe the saving message because the saving message is not 
he who commits to me and promises to serve me and gives up everything has everlasting life. That's not what believe means in any language. You know, Hebrew, Greek, English, that's not what it means. And so the danger we have is when people get confused about faith, they're now confused about the saving message. Because our message is sola fide, by faith alone. Therefore, we cannot afford to lose what faith is or we don't have a message anymore. Because now we don't know what to tell people to do. Commitment faith version of John 6.47. He who commits to serve me for the rest of his life has everlasting life. That is not what Jesus said. That is not what Jesus meant. How about persevering faith version of John 6.47. He who perseveres in good works in my name till death has everlasting life. That is not what Jesus said. That is not what Jesus meant. Justification by special faith is false advertising. This guy is selling unassembled snowmen for sale cheap, and if you can read that, it says, can look like this. <laughs> but assembly is required. Well, hello, the snow is free. It's all over everywhere. Eternal life is free. There's no assembly required. There's no commitment, there's no works, there's no obedience other than obeying the command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. It's simply trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So my challenge to all of us is keep the faith. Remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8? This is a passage that stirs my heart, and I know it stirs all of your hearts. Paul says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. Those are allusions back to 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, remember? Where he says, I don't fight as one who beats the air. I don't run with uncertainty. He's got his eyes on the prize. Here at the end of his life as he's facing martyrdom, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, Jesus is not only our Savior, he's not only our Lord, but Jesus is our judge too, will give to me on that day, he's talking about the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. This sounds an awful lot like 1 John 2.28. My little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink back in shame at his coming. Notice this comment from D. Edmund Hebert on 2 Timothy 4.7 in the word the faith. He has a great comment saying that it refers to the unadulterated precious gospel. Here, by the faith, Paul does not mean merely his own personal faith in Christ, but Paul is thinking of the gospel as the precious deposit that was entrusted to him. Amid the countless dangers encountered from active foes and false friends, he has unflinchingly held to the gospel and has guarded it against perversion and adulteration. That is a great quote. My challenge to all of us is, we have been entrusted with that same message. The Apostle Paul has given it to us, the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has given us the gospel according to Jesus, which is the gospel of the apostles, which is the one who simply believes in Jesus has everlasting life, or a man is justified by faith alone and not by the works of the law. So may we be people who never forget that we have eternal life simply by faith in Jesus, and may we not be confused about what faith is, a concern I have is that we in the free grace camp, because we're surrounded by people who are saying that faith really isn't faith, it's something else, are going to be pulled in. And we end up saying things like faith really isn't intellectual belief. Faith really isn't like believing these lights are on in here. It's not like believing that George Washington is the first president. No, it's trusting a person. And then they can't quite tell you what that is. But you kind of know when you do it, they say. Except they go through real doubts about their own personal assurance because trust is ambiguous for them. If they mean by trust simply believing in Jesus for eternal life, then that is being convinced of the facts of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, John 6, 47, Galatians 2, 15 and 16. So may we be people 
who keep the faith. Beware of wrong views of faith. We can't very well keep the faith if we don't know what faith itself is. Okay, we've got some minutes for questions. Pass them down to the middle and the guys will pick them up and I'll do my best to give an answer to the questions we have. And Sean, is that how much time I have left in the Q&A? Okay. Okay, here's one. Um, It says, uh, the Bible does not say, trust Christ and you will be saved. Rather, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I agree. As with assurance, why not say trust is of the essence of saving faith? That's a good point. I agree. We're called to believe in Jesus Christ. Um, When I ask a Baptist apologist why the Gospel of John mentions nothing more than faith as a requirement for justification, he said the term believe is in the active voice and it thus implies commitment. Does the active voice ever make a difference in the interpretation? Well, yeah, it makes a difference in the interpretation, but the active voice does not tell us where faith is essentially a passive reception of something or whether it's an active doing of something. Now, of course, in the Pauline sense, uh, faith is not a work because the entire by grace you have been saved through faith is, is a gift of God. It's not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. But Jesus does say in John 6.29, when asked in John 6.28, what works must we do that we work the works of God? This is the work, singular, that you believe in him whom the Father sent. So believing is an action, but it's essentially a passive action. It's simply an agreement with what God has said. And the idea that there's commitment in there because it's the active voice does not fit grammar. Um, if John 11:25 and 26 limits saving faith to this life, does this rule out opportunity for infants to believe after this life? Uh, well, there's two ways to look at that. In my view... There's a general principle. In, first of all, the Bible does not tell us about what happens to babies who die or what happens to the hopelessly retarded who die. But God does have a principle in Scripture, and that is God holds people accountable only for that which they're capable of doing. Unless babies are capable of believing, which it seems in Scripture they're not, then if a baby dies, there's really only two possibilities that I can see. Number one, they all get into the millennial and eternal kingdom. Number two, they all get into the millennial kingdom, and then if they come to faith in Jesus during the millennial kingdom, they get into the eternal kingdom, and if they don't, then they don't. I'm inclined toward view two. Now, it has a little bit of a problem because Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed a man once to die and then comes the judgment, but, you know, we've had other people who've died more than once, right? We've had quite a few people who have experienced physical death twice, so it could happen. And that would be a nice way of tying the bow because then everybody who would have eternal life would be a person who had believed in Jesus Christ. And these people would live out their natural life. Of course, it creates lots of other problems like where are they now and what are they doing and this sort of thing. And I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. (laughs) But the idea that God could condemn people who did not have an opportunity to believe is beyond the teaching of Scripture. Because God holds people accountable for what they're capable of doing. Doesn't the grace message promote a sovereign God greater than the confusion view? I think it does, because what it means is God has sovereignly decided that anyone who believes in his Son has everlasting life, even though they're not worthy of it. Nobody's worthy of eternal life, right? Only Jesus is worthy of eternal life. No other human being is worthy of it. Doesn't Romans, doesn't Paul say in Romans that God justifies the ungodly? I, to me, that does exalt the sovereignty of God. If God weren't sovereign, we'd all be fouled up because then there'd be some other being out in the universe that could take away our eternal life, that could cast us into some other place besides the lake of fire. Maybe he's got something else. Maybe he's got an ocean of fire or something. Uh, <laughs> do we believe with our heart or our head or both for salvation? And Romans 10.10 10 is cited. I have a, in the first chapter of my book, Confident in Christ, I have a discussion of this. 
in the Bible, the terms heart, cardia, and mind, nous, are used interchangeably. For example, in Romans 12, 2, it doesn't say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your hearts. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Minds are not bad things for God to renew. <laughs> and so, the heart can be used as the inner person, just like the soul can be used for the inner person, or just like the mind can be used for the inner person. So to, psycho, psycho, psychologic, to put a psychological spin on faith and say, well, you've got to have some kind of, you know, head faith won't get you there, but heart faith will, man, does that confuse people. Because then they're like, how do you get this heart faith? Uh, temporary faith is fully faith. Is temporary faith that it's emotion-driven faith? When you're re feeling really great, you trust Christ completely. When you're depressed, you doubt. No. Faith is being convinced that what Jesus says is true. Now, can a person who has certain disorders, like, for example, people with obsessive-compulsive disorder, I'm not talking about people who are just a bit crazy like me that are obsessive-compulsive. I'm talking about people who are checking the lock on the door 50 times every night. They're washing their hands 10 times an hour. These kinds of people can be sure one minute they have eternal life by faith in Jesus, and the next minute they're in despair. But they have a brain chemistry problem, and they don't think straight. And without medication, my experience has been those people go down and down and down. But people who can think straight, of course, once we believe something, somehow something has to happen to move us off of that belief. And faith is not essentially something emotional. Uh, let's see. Doesn't it take illumination of the Spirit to be convinced of the truth of the Gospel? Absolutely. No one's born again without the work of the Spirit. Remember, Jesus said that when he comes into the world, John 1, 9, that he enlightens every man. As Jesus comes into the world, there's not only general revelation, but John 16, 9 to 11, it says, the Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I believe that is universal, even apart from hearing the Bible. In other words, I believe every single person on earth knows they're a sinner because the Spirit is convicting them of that. They know there is a time of judgment coming ahead, and they know God is righteous. I believe those three things are independent of the Word of God. The Spirit uses the Word of God to reinforce that, but it seems to fit in all cultures that you find people who have a fear of the divine being, and they believe there's some judgment after this life, and they're afraid they're going to fall short. And what they need to hear is, the one who believes in Jesus has everlasting life. Uh, it says, you have received Christ as Savior, you have received him as Lord, but have you received him as judge? <laughs> I guess this is a joke. Um, I'm not sure what receiving Christ as Savior is. That's not a biblical expression. I'm not sure what receiving Christ as Lord is. That's also not a biblical expression. John 1.12 says as many as received him. It doesn't say him as Savior or him as Lord. And clearly in John 1.12, it goes on to define it as to those who believe in his name. The way we receive him is believing in his name. And we know that believing in his name is believing what he has said, what he has promised. So what a person needs to understand is when a new person comes to faith in Christ, I hope we're teaching them that not only is Jesus our Savior, not only is our Lord, but there's a coming day when he's going to judge us at a place called the judgment seat of Christ, and we make it very clear that although eternal life is absolutely free, we get no free pass if we are living like the devil. If we live like the devil, then we experience the consequences in this life, and we'll answer for that at the judgment seat of Christ. I always like Dr. O. Rodmacher's illustration of this. He talks about the fact that we're all going to have full cups in eternity. you know. But some people are going to have little demitasse cups, and some people are going to have cups the size of swimming pools. Which size cup do you want? Now, our cup is going to be our ability to glorify Jesus. And the more we glorify him, the more honor and glory we'll bring to him, and that will bring us more joy. Everybody's going to glorify Jesus in the kingdom, but how much? So we need to teach people that Jesus indeed will judge us, but we also need to get them away from the idea that Jesus is just waiting like that penguin yesterday to smack us down. No, Jesus wants to reward every one of us. He wants to say, well done, good and faithful servant to every believer. And he's given us the Spirit, and he prays for us every day, interceding before the Father, that we might hear that well done. People need to understand that judgment by Jesus is a gracious thing. 
And our loving and gracious Lord is going to lovingly and graciously evaluate us at his judgment seat. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much that eternal life is a free gift and it's received by simple faith alone. May we never lose clarity on the issue of faith, for it is vital to our evangelism. It is vital to our discipleship. It's vital to the entire Christian life and Christian teaching. We pray these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen.